Give me a second. I'm still setting up here. Is uh, the audio okay here? Somebody let me know if you can hear me okay. All right, so start the recording back up, I think. Yes. Um, all right, so we'll get going here. So welcome to our fourth week, fourth unit. Um, so I'm going to see, you know, as usual, I, I mean, kind of for these sessions to be more like help sessions. So definitely if people have questions, want to ask about things, uh, feel free to, you know, um, um, unmute and and um, and shout them out or type them in to the um, um, to the uh, the chat. Uh, if you're on Zoom here, as I was saying before I started the recording, um, uh, something kind of came up, so I decided it'd be a lot quicker for me to to do it from my home office here today. But uh, probably back into the classroom on Monday, you know. But uh, let me let me know, you know, if, if you need. Uh, a meeting or something, um, or of course, I encourage people to, to come to the sessions in person um, if you want to uh, talk about things in person as well, usually. So, but next Monday we should be back to the classroom then. Um, so yeah, my, my intention was to probably talk mostly about the second assignment and um, we can um, um, talk about this week's materials. Um, um, lecture notebooks and things if anybody was working through those had questions about those so um, let me go and get my let me go and get my box up so I, I still had a question last week about uh, starting up your vagrant box you know so just a reminder uh, if you are using the class dev box you have to change into probably your repos directory I just put mine in a, in a directory called boxes and you have to change into that actual repository directory and just do the vagrant up to uh, to bring up your box. So as I've said before, you should always for the for these boxes that I gave you, they're being managed by this tool called vagrant, and you should always be using vagrant up to boot it back up and vagrant halt to to uh, shut it down cleanly. So. Um, and you know you want to you want to look for um, um, the port numbers being forwarded, and this will tell you what port number you need to go to um, on your browser um, in order to connect with your virtual machine, the the Jupyter Hub server running on there. Um, and probably want to check that your um, uh, shared folders are being or else be a little bit difficult to submit assignments for this class if you can't get. For notebooks or other files um, in your virtual box in order to, for example, upload those for classes and things. So, so yeah, you want, you want to make sure that that's working too whenever you boot up from the command line. So, if anybody has a question, let me know. I heard somebody on mute there. Uh, so, let's see if that's running. Um, so, it should be at uh, your 127.001, port 8000 um, on a browser on your host machine. Your Jupyter Hub's running. And we'll usually remember your session, so you'll have it'll put you back where you left off. It'll even start up the, the kernels that you were running before. So I'll shut those all down, get everything kind of clean. Um, and I still have one or two people who had missed kind of this memo from like a week ago. Um, so yeah, I mean, so I'll just remind again about this. So, so if you try and run a notebook and you get a message, or if you try and import the scikit-learn uh, and you get a message that it can't import, so um, So we're actually working, uh, and, and hopefully this doesn't confuse people, but uh, you know, so the numbers uh, are more about the chapter number than about the, my numbering of the weeks or the units. So the, the numbers for the lecture notebooks um, uh, won't always match up because we are kind of on chapter three now here. 
So um, anyway, as I said, you know, if so, if you run this, so for example, um, I think that we don't have scikit-learn installed in the, the regular Python 3 kernel. You have to be using the Python 3 uh, data science kernel. So if, um, um, so if, if you try to import anything from scikit-learn, um, or any um, um, any other things. Well, um, in this case, probably um, uh, if you were using the right kernel, the the thing that was missing was scikit learn. But but yeah, for this kernel, we don't have any of the scientific other scientific Python things. So so yeah, in this case, it can't find Seaborn. Um, anyway, um, um, yeah. So make certain that you. If, if it's not able to import scikit-learn, you do have to get into a terminal and uh, install it by hand. So I'd somehow miss that in the setting up of the um, the your your dev box here in the Jupyter Hub server. So um, so yeah, I mean you know if you don't know this, this is kind of an aside, but if you don't know that these boxes uh, that I call boxes, I mean it's, it's running a full virtual machine and it's running Ubuntu Linux under there. So uh, there's various ways to get into other the, the actual machine, you know, for example, to get a command line prompt. Um, so it's not a, it's not um, a primary goal of this class, but but um, you know, it's it it would be good to um, if you never get it formally in any classes as a master student to, to to pick up some you know using Linux from the command line, using virtualization. So so a lot of stuff if you're going to be a data scientist or uh, developer or programmer with your um, with your degree from our program. I mean, a lot of stuff is going virtualization now. So knowing, uh, you know, um, how to, to set up uh, virtual machines on uh, cloud platforms like Amazon or, you know, or use them like this. So, so we're using virtual virtualization technology, but just in your local, um, you know, your, your own host machine. Uh, but either way, um, you know, learning a little bit about kind of virtualization and cloud-based stuff is always good. So, anyway, so you do have to get into your terminal. Um, and uh, the, the, the user that we're using on your virtual machine is this Vagrant user. Uh, but you, it, and the Vagrant user has super user privileges. So you can actually change to the, become the super user by that sudo-s command. But that's kind of one of the command line things. Um, well, using Linux from a command line. But anyway, that gets you root. And from there, you can do the um, the things you need to do to um, work with the, our uh, Python installation, including installing packages. So, so Conda, with the distribution that we're using for our Python, Conda is kind of like a, pa a, a package manager for Python packages. So it's more than that, but, but uh, that's one of the main things that you see if you're using Conda to manage your Python uh, distribution. I recommend Conda uh, right now. It, it's really kind of one of the best sort of package managers and, and also for setting up environments and kernels and things like that. You know, so I, I usually use Conda whenever I'm setting up a machine where I want to install Python and uh, machine learning libraries or whatever, so like this. So oh, um, yeah, so by default, you have to, by default, you're in kind of um, a basic uh, kernel or basic, it, what are known as an environment. So you can set up, basically these environments work kind of also, it's kind of like a virtualization as well. The, these environments allow you to have a whole separate uh, structure set up so that you can um, install different configurations of Python packages in this case. So, so basically we create an environment where we install all the packages that we're using for um, the, 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 the notebooks for, this, for our machine learning classes in this uh, Python 3 data science. Um, but you, know, you, you can create your, um, um, your own environments. Um, and configure them for other projects or other configurations, right? But, and you'll notice that your prompt changes to kind of tell you which kind of environment you, that you're working on in, so. so 
however I got installed, but, but, but um, anyway, hopefully everybody's past that part, but, uh, but I thought I'd talk a little bit more about um, kind of what's going on behind the scenes here, you know, so, so this is good stuff to learn a little bit about and be useful for you um, um, in many contexts. These kinds of skills are always useful to, to collect and build. Um, so. um, so yeah, if you have questions, go ahead and um, um, let me know. So somebody was, was raising their hand, but. Um, um, hello, sir. Sure, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sir, if I need to uh, download the scikit package from the command prompt, um, first I need to type vagrant ssh. Um, yeah, so there's different ways you can get into the terminal on your virtual machine. So I showed you one. So, so you, if you've got your Jupyter Hub running, you can just um, um, open up a terminal from the launcher and that will get you into your command line environment to do it. Uh, so the, the, the thing you're suggesting is you can also from your host machine, um, if you're in that in, in the same directory where you brought your beggar box up, you can yes. also use beggar oh, yes. H to get in. So that would also get you a command line. So bo both ways, um, you're, you're in, in both cases, you're in a command line environment on your um, virtual machine. So, so those are equivalent ways to get access to that command line environment to do things like install common packages. So. Yeah. Okay, we can do both the both the ways. Okay. Yeah. So both of those are yeah, both of those are equivalent, right? So so in both cases, you're into the virtual machine and, and you've got a command line prompt um, that you can then run normal Linux command line stuff from like installing packages and things. So yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. Sure. Good question. Um So yeah, anyway, yeah, I mean, you should of course be able to, to um, import all these things on the notebooks I give you for the lectures and for the um, assignments and things. Although again, you do have to be using the kernel that has the, um, uh, all the libraries installed, you know, so in particular, Matplotlib, Seaborn, Pandas, uh, Scikit-learn, um, and NumPy are the ones that we mainly use for this class. So. Oh, and stats, uh, stats lib uh, for this, uh, this week and this assignment as well should be in there. I think hopefully that one's already installed. I don't know if I've checked that one yet either, but uh, but yeah, if you use the right kernel, um, then it should be able to load those just fine. All right. Um, So, like I said, uh, probably I'll just go ahead and skip to assignment two. Um, we, we looked at it a little bit before, um, but yeah, for this this unit, um, um, yeah, we are kind of working on these the chapter three basically from our um, hands-on machine learning textbook. Um, and um, as I mentioned in my announcement, um, you know, also if you have some time um, next week, we're, we're gonna be getting into a little bit more details, uh, you know, the mathematical kinds of details of something. You know, and, and you know, I, I, uh, hopefully I, I, I don't wanna scare people off, but I, I do think um, that it is useful to, to um, look at that and, and try and understand it a bit, right? So it, it's probably not 100% necessary that, the, that you uh, understand kind of deeply the mathematics but um, but anyway be ready for that so, so next week we'll be getting into looking at more in detail linear regression and how it works at the the the, the, the fundamental kind of the, the uh, statistical level of what it's doing um so the, the mathematical description a bit right so. um All right, so let's 
Let me jump back over to the um, assignment. Let's do that first, and then I'll come back and maybe talk some more about these notebooks like I did last time. Let's see if people want to discuss those. Um, So yeah, let me, let me check the, the Python 3 data science kernel, make certain that um, it's got all these libraries loaded that we're trying to use on the assignment here that, that, that you're supposed to need to have for the assignment, including the staff model, the scikit-learn. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think just the scikit-learn was missing there, um, but everything else that we need, at least for right now, should be there, so. Um, yeah, now that I think about it, I, um, maybe, yeah, uh, so, you know, of course, so this assignment, we are getting into um, our first machine learning model. So um, I asked you to uh, do some linear regressions um, on some data sets that we have. Um, so I didn't give you the, the command to load the data set, but, uh, you know, you ought to load the data set like we had to do in assignment one from the um, the oops, from the dot CSV file given here. So again, this is, um, you know, um, I guess it have maybe made it even more of a uh, more explicit, but that should be one directory up from the current directory. So I mean, that, that's how you should find that file and load it. So this particular uh, data file, um, I think this comes from um, our textbook or, or similar to the one that we use in the chapter three on the textbook where um, we're discussing linear regression here. So, so yeah, if we go up one directory, go to our data, make certain this is in here. So um, this one here. So yeah, the, the editor in Jupyter Hub now can handle other kinds of files as well. So, you know, if, if you open up something's common separate value file, give you kind of a nice view of it um, um, in the table format here. Um, so yeah, so for this first, first assignment, we're, um, uh, this first question of the second assignment here, um, we're using a simple one variable with one um, um, output. Uh, so, so the, the the population size is kind of the the x. It's, it's the input that we're going to be using to build a linear regression model. So that is the um, independent variable, and then profit is the dependent variable. I, I I think our textbook you know kind of goes over some of this terminology. So this is, this is kind of terminology from statistics, things about the independent versus the dependent variable or the X variable versus the Y variable. So, um, but then this is the thing that we're gonna try and predict. So profit um, for this um, business here, this food truck business or whatever it was um, based on population size. So there's probably some correlation between, you know, bigger cities, you're more likely to be able to generate bigger profits more easily, that kind of thing. Um, Um, so, yeah, maybe I might have to, I might have to change my mind and can skip over to just looking at the uh, materials for this week. So, 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 so the, the first question is, is really asking you to load the data and then all this stuff should be, I hope, relatively, you know, there's examples of doing these with, these with other data sets in the materials from this week. So fitting the linear regression um, and um, Um, using scikit-learn, so there's lots of there's lots of ways to do linear regression. There's linear regression um, in um, uh, lots of different libraries um, or ways to do it. So besides scikit-learn, um, I also actually ask you to do it using stats model. Yeah, 
you can also use like uh, just from basic NumPy, it has things like uh, doing a uh, polynomial fit, uh, which I believe we show examples of that. Um, and, and, and that kind of reflects the, um, the, the, the fundamental nature of linear regression. So it's, it's often the first thing that you turn to to, to see. If, so if I have uh, some data um, and I want to try to make a prediction, um, you know, I might try and fit a linear regression if it looks like the data or it has some sort of a linear relationship. Um, so you have to give a fit um, and, and, and how much explanation that, that can have from my modeling. So the R squared score, we, we talk a little bit about. Um, um, in our materials for this week as well. So R squared is a measure kind of, of, of how well the uh, linear regression model that, that you apply to the data fits it, all right? So, so the, you know, the, these R squared scores can range from zero to one. So if it's zero, that means that the uh, model isn't explaining the data at all. So the data is pretty much completely random or there's no, there's no explanation explanatory power uh, between the independent and the dependent variable with a linear model, a linear fit. Um, or it can be 1.0 where it's a perfect fit. So that you only get a 1.0 R squared score if, um, if your model exactly fits every point, right? So you don't, you don't, you don't expect 1.0 either very often because in that case, you're trying to predict data that's actually has no noise and, and it actually directly fits on some uh, line between the independent variables and the, and the um, dependent variable that you're trying to predict. Yeah. Um, but that, but yeah, if you do this right, I mean, um, 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 and I, maybe I'll talk a little bit about this here next. Um, but in this case, when you fit a linear model to data that has just one uh, input variable, you end up with two parameters, um, which are known as the slope and the intercept. Okay, so as, as we talk about in our materials for this week, that, that's really defining a line. Um, um, so you know, if, if if you have the the slope intercept form of a line, um, and you have those two parameters. Uh, that exactly defines one line um, when, when you have just one variable, uh, one uh, independent variable um, and a predictor, uh, a dependent variable. So anyway, um, I mean, you should get exactly these same values for the slope and the intercept when you fit your linear regression, both whatever you're using to fit a linear regression, you know, using scikit-learn or using stats model. Um, so, so then, yeah, I asked you to, to fit again using stats model. Um, so this is covered in the, the video. So I, I have a whole video about stats model and, and a lecture notebook. Uh, maybe I can talk about that, but there's an example also fitting linear regression. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, because um, as I talk about in the video on using stats model, um, for various reasons, um, uh, lots of times uh, fitting a linear regression model like this, it'll actually add in uh, what's known as this bias term, right? So you don't, have, you don't, it, you know, it takes care of that for you usually when you're using a more high level way of fitting the linear regression. But stats model is meant to be more of a, um, um, kind of a low level, uh, the, the way people that are used to kind of doing statistical manipulations directly would work with data. So in that case, um, the, the bias term isn't added on automatically by the, uh, the, the stats models functions for um, um, uh, sending a linear regression. So you have to do a little bit of extra work um, uh, to get the correct um, linear fit here, right? But if, again, if you do it correctly, though, you should get exactly the same intercept and slope um, uh, when you fit that data here. So. All right, so I don't have, <coughs> I suspect usually most people actually maybe find the second assignment um, 
um, in many ways, a little bit simpler than the first one, right? But there are, there are examples of, 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 of all these, of sending the linear regression using scikit-learn and, and um, stats model um, in our materials from this week and the past week. Um, and then the, the second part, um, so, you know, we talk about um, what a regression model is, um, and we talk about the difference between um, um, doing regression prediction versus doing uh, classification, okay? So when you're doing um, a regression, um, what you're doing is you're trying to predict real value numbers, okay? So, so in this case, um, you can think of the profit as, as, as it can be a, a, a real value. So it can have any number of decimal points. Um, and, you know, the profit can even be negative, but, but yes, yeah, so it can be any number um, 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 in some range, right? Um, so for, for a regression, uh, you're trying to fit and, and make a model that predicts real value numbers. So classification is fundamentally uh, a different idea. So for a classification, you're trying to predict um, a class or a, a category, okay? And so the most basic classification is a binary classification, right? So for binary classification, um, um, it could be yes or no or true or false, right? So, so for, for your independent variable or independent variables, so in this case, we've actually got two independent variables. So you got two exam scores um, from, um, from this other data file that we're using for our logistic regression, right? Oh, and by the way, I'm sure I talk about this in, in the materials, but the, um, you know, it's called linear regression. And then this that we use um, uh, here for doing a, a class of classification, um, there's also a logistic regression. It's kind of a unfortunate or a bad name. Again, this is historical uh, because these were first developed in the context of statistics and statisticians. Um, so um, I usually prefer to think of this as a logistic classifier um, personally um, because regression, except for in this context, usually means um, a real valued predictor, right? So, so some number that can take any value on a range, whereas a classifier or doing a classification task, uh, you're trying to predict a discrete um, um, class where the simplest is a binary class, true or false or yes or no. Or in this case, um, we're trying to predict whether we want to admit or not admit students, right? So that's our categories, admit or not admit. Uh, based on the exam scores, or I guess really what we're predicting is whether uh, this particular university, um, where we have data about whether they admitted or not admitted students, um, and we've got these two uh, independent variables that we can use to build our model and make predictions of, so, so we want to use that to, to make our uh, classification prediction of, of whether they would admit or not admit a student given um, their exam score data. So, So yeah, this is this other one assigned to. So yeah, in this case, we've got um, um, three columns instead of two in the column separated values. Uh, and, and, and so I should have pointed out, so our two columns, you know, the, the one is gonna be used for the X value, um, um, you know, for our, for our data for the training. And then the other is our label. So for the regression, our real value number, right? But in the second problem, you know, we've got, uh, uh, three columns, two of the columns are input. So these two would have to be pulled out to become your, your X array or however you want to call it. Um, so you can fit a model, like a fit a logistic regression using scikit-learn. Um, and then this third column is going to be the output that we're trying to predict. So in this case, it's, it's the binary um, data. So we're just using zeros and ones here. So, you know, typically, so for real data, you know, the, 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 you know it might not always be zero and one. It, um, normally for a um, class of classifier or a classification machine learning algorithm, we would have to turn it into zero and one. So actually numeric data in order to build a classifier for it. But, you know, so, so you know, this could have been admit or no, it could have been like a string 
admit or not admit or something like that, right? And like we showed last time, so if you have string data, you'd have to use um, um, some sort of a some sort of a data cleaning process then to um, transform that into numeric data. You know? So in this case, normally we um, for a binary classifier, we we normally um, map the, uh, the the false case or the negative case to zero. So zero should mean like not admit or, or not admitted in this case. And, and we, met, we we um, map ones to the positive case. So, so this would be the, the students that were admitted here for the one. So um, if we were building like a, a spam, email spam classifier, um, our, our classes might be spam or not spam. So in that case, we'd be using zero for the not spams, which are the messages that, that you, you um, uh, um, uh, want to allow your person to see if, if you're building um, a, a spam filter for an email system. And we would use the ones for that it is spam. Um, so that kind of thing, right? So um, I'm sure I give lots of examples or our textbook gives lots of examples of binary classifiers. So, you know, you might build a, have a classifier where the data is cancer or not cancer, you know, or sick or healthy. You know? So, so, so binary classification is the, the most basic, right? But, but we, we will be building classifiers where we use uh, multi-class classification. So, I mean, again, just thinking of, of cancer, um, like, like I just mentioned, and instead of, of have cancer or not have cancer, you might have data that you're trying to build a model where um, 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 your labels are like stage one, stage two, stage three, cancer, things like that, right? So that, that, that's just a quick example of, of multi-class um, uh, classifier that, that uh, you might want to build um, this kind of a classification system for them. Uh, um, So, I mean, uh, I've, I've had questions then about what exactly I'm looking for for the, the first thing for the plot here. So yeah, in both cases, I did ask, ask you to plot the data before and after you fit the model. Um, so in this case, I mean, I'm looking for uh, still a two-dimensional plot where the x-axis should be the exam one score, the y-axis should be the exam two score, um, and then you should use some sort of an indication then of the point. So, so you use like either different colors on the points or different marker types, right? So you have to go back maybe and, and kind of look at um, our lecture videos on Matplotlib, right? On, on, on things, how you might do that. You can also use Seaborn if you want to or other things, but, but yeah, I'd encourage you, you know, to, 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 to start with Matplotlib especially if you work through the, the matplotlib um, uh, notebooks and things right so um so yeah in this case i'm basically looking for you know x-axis is the exam one score y-axis is the exam two score and just plotting those data so um so like for this first line here this point should in uh, assuming that the first column should be exam one and the second column is exam two here so there should be a point at uh, uh, 34.6 on the x-axis and 78.0 on the y-axis point there. And then, you know, like for example, maybe use a marker. So maybe use like a, a an O um, or a round, a circle for um, um, for not admits and um, and uh, a square maybe for admits or something like that, right? So different marker types for these different types, right? That's what I'm looking at them for here. So, so um, you might have to like um, uh, do some NumPy array manipulation. So an easy way to do that is just to create uh, two views into the array. So one view of the array where you have all the data uh, where the the um, where it was not admit, where it was zero, and then you can plot those all with one particular marker type, right? Um, and then um, another. A view of the array where the where this column was a one, and then you can plot just those with the other marker type. Okay, so that's the simplest thing you could do for the the plot that I'm asking for here. 
Uh, but in fact, I guess kind of from my hints on the comments here, I'm pushing you towards that sort of a solution. So first, extracting out the, the zeros of the not admitted students and plotting those with some sort of a color or marker shape or marker type, um, and then pulling out the admitted students and then plotting those on the same plot with a different marker. Okay. Um, make certain that you um, add, add a legend. You know, so um, I, I, I mentioned this in the notebooks for Matplotlib. Um, but you know, I will be asking you to always try and, and um, um, learn good practices for creating figures and things. So, so you should always label your axes, your x and y axes. Um, you know, if you have different types of plots. Uh, so in this case, if we have if you have different marker shapes or marker colors or whatever, um, you should have a legend um, um, added to the plot that that describes you know. That the differences in those marker types and what they mean, that type of thing. All right. Um, so then, I mean, after you get that plotted, um, I ask you to, to do a logistic regression using the scikit-learns uh, uh, logistic regression. So, so again, this um, should be pretty familiar once you get to this point. So, so I mean, all of, of the stuff that we'll do with Scikit Learn follows kind of the same pattern. I mean, we'll, we'll be using different um, um, different kinds of methods for building models. So, so for for uh, fitting a model and then using that fitted model to do predictions. But the API is identical in all cases, right? So, so, so once you correctly gotten your data clean and loaded um, um, and separated into the input, uh, typically called X, and then the, the output, the, the label you're trying to predict, which is our binary uh, zero, 01 number in this case, you ought to be able to fit a log logistic regression uh, and then use that to make predictions and things and find out the fitted coefficient. So in this case, as we'll talk about probably in more detail next week, um, but in this case, if you have two independent variables, um, uh, we're going to end up with a model that actually has three parameters. So, so it actually has two. Um, uh, so, so previously here, we, we had two parameters, which we called the slope and the intercept um, for the, the first question, slope and the intercept. So, so in, in this case, you can think of this as the um, um, the, the slope for dimension one, the slope for dimension two. So, so this is the relationship between dimension one and the, the value that we're predicting, the, the relationship between dimension two and the value that we're predicting. And then this is kind of the intercept term or what's known as the bias term. Um, oh yeah, so yeah, I guess for scikit learn again for logistic regression, um, you you might have to pull these out as two different parameters from the model that you fit. So you have should have uh, inter intercept underscore, um, which will get you the um, actually the first value is the intercept, I believe, and then the second is I might have been pointing to the wrong ones there, but yeah, the first value would be your intercept. Um, and then the second two are going to be the the um, the, the, um, the coefficients, which you can kind of think of again as, as the slopes uh, for our two different dimensions for this data that we're fitting here. All right. Um, oh yeah, in this case, um, is this true? And so so. Unlike here, you probably should get exactly these numbers when you fit the linear regression. Um, but, but yeah, it, for logistic regression, there's actually some meta parameters. Um, um, and, and in short, um, you might get some differences. Um, in the exact values, like like a few, I think like the, the first or second decimal place will be the same, but then after that, um, uh, there might be some slight differences then um, in your slope and intercept or your coefficient and the intercept. Um, 
you uh, that you get here when you say the logistic regression. Uh, Okay, and then finally, I ask you to visualize the decision boundary, um, and maybe if I get a chance here, I'll talk about that. We should, we should get up and, and try and talk about that a little bit. Um, so this might be the, the, the most complex kind of task that you have to do here. So you basically, though, you have to use these numbers to um, plot the line on your graph. So I basically want you to, to, to do the same plot that you did um, on the first or second step here after you load the data, but then add on a, a line that represents the um, decision boundary that was fit by your logistic regression model, okay? Um, so, so I believe I, I, I talked a little bit about that in um, one of the lecture videos here. But um, um, just real quickly, I, I think that um, um, when I go to the lecture notebook, um, um, we, we can talk about this a little bit more detail. But the basic idea is that this parameter, uh, the, the, one way to do this is you can think of this as defining a it's not a line since we've actually got uh, two dimensions and we're predicting a third dimension so, so it's actually a hyperplane that, that this defines um, but um, um, well in this case though um, we, we can use this to determine what the line looks like on the two dimensions of the exam one and the exam two uh, plot that we have here, right? So basically, this is this is the coefficient times the exam one. Um, value, if I have it right, it might be backwards here, but but um, so you end up with a, a line something like um, uh, 0 0.2053 times let's call it exam one plus 0 0.20058 times exam two. Um, Minus 25.05219. So that's the um, the intercept term there equals zero. Okay, so the, all the places where this um, equation equals zero um, are the, the decision boundary uh, in this case. So, so if you can if you can figure out a way to plot that um, on your um, figure, uh, the, the line defined by this, right? Or, or you know, again, since if I, I told you to use uh, exam one for the x-axis and exam two for the y-axis, right? or rearranging where those two things equal. That that will give you your your line that that defines the decision boundary. Hopefully, I hopefully I didn't um, mix those around or something. So it might be that, that I've got some of these backwards or something. But but that's the basic idea um, um, for the relationship between these parameters and the the decision boundary. Right? So the decision boundary, um, as as I talk about um, in our um, uh, materials for this week. I mean that that. So, so anything on one side of the decision boundary, um, the model is going to classify as not accept, right? So, so the, this logistic regression that you're fitting is going to fit a linear uh, decision boundary. So it's, it's a linear version of logistic regression, right? Um, so, so in that case, since we get this, this line for our decision boundary in, in the two dimensions here, anything on one side of the line um, is going to be the uh, not admit, you know, so we're, we're going to predict not admit and anything on the other side of the line um, would be uh, a prediction of admit. So, so that's basically what the logistic regression is doing when you fit it to the, the data here.
All right. So I'm going to ask you to, to get some other things, precision recall scores. Um, oh, and, and confusion matrix. Uh, things like that. So, um, Yeah, and then, and then finally, kind of like for the first part, I asked you to do the same thing, but use the stats model. Um, so again, in the in the video on stats model, I also show in the stats model library to perform a logistic regression. Um, so again, um, you know, it doesn't add in the, um, uh, the, the, the dummy feature, so you have to add that in uh, like we show. Um, And uh, yeah, I guess I didn't ask you to replot anything, but but yeah, you should show what the coefficients are uh, in the intercept term. You should get again um, um, because of the the, the meta parameter defaults that are used. Uh, you get something close, but maybe not exactly here. Not not exactly the same value, right? Because it will be using a slightly different version of the meta parameters for the um, um, the stats model logistic regression in this case. I'll talk about that more probably um, uh, when we discuss the uh, solution for the assignment. Well, I talked a little bit about it right here in, in our um, assignment too. So, um, but but you know we haven't talked about regularization yet and this regularization penalty. So. So when, when, once, you know, if you, if you don't understand this, uh, you should understand this quite a bit more um, in uh, the, the, the unit after next week, uh, in two or three units, when we get to talking about regularization for uh, machine learning models. Okay. Um, So yeah, that's all I can think about for the assignment too. Does anybody, is that, uh, anybody have any kind of pressing questions about it now that you've seen it, what we're asking for here? I'm thinking now that I went through this, I've got a couple of things that I can go into a little bit more detail. So, so maybe we'll go um, next and look at the, um, uh, lecture notebooks. Um, um, so, so maybe I'll try and go through the SAS model one from the, I think that was from the previous week, and then our ones from this week that uh, talk a little bit about the basics of linear and logistic regression. So. Uh, but um, this would be a, a good place to um, um, take our break here, almost a little bit earlier than I normally do. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm thinking about taking about five minutes here. And then we'll come back and, and I'll, I'll bring up the, uh, uh, the materials for this week and, and maybe we can talk about some of these in a little bit more detail. If that helps or if that further prompts questions about the assignment or other things. Um, and some on the mean square and the second part with decision tree we got a zero as a square root, which was the first example was underfitting, I guess, and the second was overfitting. Right. So normally we actually do the test data, right? I just want to know. Yes. So, so the, yeah, yeah. So that, I mean, that's the general thing of anybody that's kind of listening to the the, the discussion or the question. So, um, when. Um, um, and, and we'll we'll talk to the we'll talk about this when, when we get to there. So you, you should never you, you always should be splitting your data up um, into some data that you use for training and um, then some that you uh, use it for testing at, at a minimum, um, so that um, 
if, if you don't do that, it, it's 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 um you know it's it's like um, training. It's it's like giving a, a test for a class for for a student, um, and you give them all the tests questions to study and then uh, you just ask them on the test uh, exactly the same question so uh, in that case you know uh, if you get a perfect score um, it's because you basically just memorized all of the um, answers to the, the the questions you've seen so the the real kind of test of a machine learning model or of a student in that kind of analogy is well can they generalize so can they actually perform um, uh, well on on data they didn't actually uh, train with or, 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 or use in general to um, 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 uh, to learn the materials, right? So, so generalization is, is important. So, um, and um, I can go back and look at that specific thing here maybe in a second. Although I was trying to I was trying to figure out something else here first here. Okay. Um, yeah, so I might be missing something that I thought was in the, um, the repository. I should share my screen again as well. Uh, it's been one more minute, one more minute here, so. Okay, uh, sorry for the pause there. I was trying to remember something. So, um, um, okay, let's get started again. Um, one thing I'll note, um, so I might not have made it as clear as I should have in the, uh, the materials for this week. So, so there is um, a, a video on the scikit-learn uh, and stats model, which will be important for the second assignment. Um, but um, I just realized that I had the, the, the lecture notebook, if you wanted to, to, to um, look through that in a uh, slightly different place. So I had it over here in the archive. Uh, I don't know if that was a mistake. I should maybe move that back over just, just to the regular. I guess I have it over here because it's not really directly from the, um, the hands-on machine learning textbook. It was, it was just um, uh, kind of additional material. but. Um, that particular notebook is on there. Um, um, so, um, as well as, as well as the other uh, ones mentioned um, for the binary multi class classification uh, on this week's materials. So, um, so getting back. Um, Um, real quickly about about the question that we were discussing before. Uh, let me rerun this here, so it'll take a while. But um, so um, yeah, from last week. Um, if you work through the, uh, the the materials on, on training and, and testing a model, a basic beginning with, with the idea of how you normally do that. So so we kind of looked at the linear regression, um, an example of fitting the linear regression model. Um, And, um, and 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 yeah, the, the the question that was being asked was was exactly right because 
uh, th this was meant to illustrate that uh, so if it, linear, linear regression doesn't seem to do very well um, if you run this notebook um, so you won't, won't get very good predictions but if you use a more sophisticated model like a the decision tree regressor um, and we'll talk about decision trees later on um, um, if you fit the model and you use it to predict um, using the same data so the question was being asked about um, um, if we fit the model and then we get predictions on the date, the same exact data that we trained with, um, um, you'll actually see that it gets a, you know, 100% correct on the classification, right? Um, but um, yeah, and, and, and yeah, the, the, the point of this is the, that the, that's not really a, um, um, it's still not a good model in this case, or, or you, you can't tell whether it's a good model or not. So it, it never really tells you anything useful if you run your predictions back on the same data that you trained the model with, right? So, um, a, a a model that um, is overlearning that data will will do very well on the predictions of the data that it was trained with, right? So in this case, it does perfectly. Um, if this notebook works the way that I described it here, um, but normally, then if you give it data that it wasn't trained with, um, you'll often see that that the performance plummets. Um, and, and that's because, so, so I mean, it, it could be that, that if you train a model, it could do really well on the data that it, it was trained with, but it can also be a good model because it, it also generalizes well. So it, do, it would do also well on data that it was not trained with. Okay. And that's, that's of course the goal that we want to uh, achieve. That, that's, that's the kind of model that we ultimately want to build something that generalize as well that, that will make good predictions on data even data that's never seen before right but you can't really tell uh, whether it's generalizing or not um, if you have it predict on the data that you, you trained with, right so you know we'll talk a lot more detail about this so, so you really have to always uh, do your evaluations of your model with other data that, that you didn't train your model with in order to, to get a feel for whether it's generalizing correctly or not, right? So we'll talk about train test split um, and, and you'll be doing that kind of stuff um, and, and uh, cross-validation training. So, so we had a quick example of that using capable cross-validation in that last notebook from last week and so on. Um, so let's get back to I'll close off some of the stuff here. So, um, for people that are working on the assignment, probably the you know um, if you haven't already, you should go through that video um, and look through the notebook on using Scikit-Learn and Stats Model in ML Library. So this this is kind of the the stuff that will directly be about um, um, the assignment too. Although you know the, the the stuff from this week on the classifiers and things um, will be useful as well. So you, you want to go through that stuff as well. Um, So as I've been talking about when I was going through the uh, the um, assignment, so th there's an example. There's examples of using Scikit-Learn and Stats Model uh, in this notebook in particular, and in the lecture video, uh, as well as other um, um, information uh, about things. So um, all on different data sets. Okay, so. Um, 
but if I haven't discussed this before, this in general is, is, is useful. So, you know, for all the stuff that we're going to be doing in this class, um, um, you should probably be thinking of, you know, the data that you're going to be using for input uh, to build your models with as a two-dimensional array. So normally we call that X. Um, and uh, where the columns are features, um, and we'll have some number in of those features. Um, and then the rows are samples. Um, and in fact, uh, did I mess that up? So, um, or I, I guess this direct, came directly from the textbook. So, but yeah, we often use like in, a uh, little n for the number of features and m uh, as in Mary for the number of samples. So, you know, if, if, if we're going to keep both the number of features uh, that we have as, in, as inputs and then the number of samples that we're training with, um, two different things. And then um, you'll have to have a separate target vector, uh, which should have the same number of, um, of, of, of rows or say same number of samples as you have rows in your data that you're using for training, right? Um, but usually the our target vector just has one value, okay, um, for each one of our uh, input samples um, for the data that we're going to build a model with. Okay? We'll talk later on about the, you know, so you can't have more than one thing that you want to predict, um, but the simplest case is having one thing, right? And then that data that you're trying to predict, um, again, if it's a, like a real value number, so if I'm trying to predict like house prices um, or profit in terms of dollars, that's a regression problem, right? So if it's a real value number um, that can take any range, um, any value within some range. But if it's a, a categorical variable that you're trying to predict, so zero, one, like a binary category, or zero, one, two, three, four, if I have four or five categories, then you're going to be trying to build a, um, a classifier. Okay, so a binary classifier, if you have just two categories or two classes, um, or a multi class classifier, if you have three or more classes that you want to predict, right? So yeah, I mean, the basics of, of scikit-learn that, that we already had of, of, in examples of this um, in our previous notebook, um, and we do it again here in this one. Um, so if you arrange your data like into an X matrix and then a Y vector, so X is your input data that you want to train with, and Y is the, the target or labels that you want to um, um, use to build the model, right? So, so if you arrange your data in that kind of a format, um, th I mean, and this could be a NumPy um, arrays, so a NumPy array, and a, a NumPy one-dimensional array for your target vector, or it could be um, Pandas data frames. Um, so scikit-learn so can use data frames nowadays. It used to not really understand anything except for NumPy arrays, uh, but now um, 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 it can handle um, Pandas data frames as well. And, and some other things. So, um, so then, you know, once you have your data arranged that way, um, you just create, you, you just choose the model that you want to um, uh, train with. So like linear regression or logistic regression are the two that we're using for our assignment here. Um, and then you, you know, you fit your model. So basically to fit the model, you give it the input features and then the target that you're trying to, to have your model learn to make predictions of. Um, and once you fit a model, then you can um, use that to predict on new data. Right? So in that case, you would give it something that has the same number of features as input, um, and it will give you predictions um, of, of what it thinks the, uh, the output or the target should be, um, even if it's data it's hadn't seen before. Right. Um, and this is, this is uh, um, a, what's known as supervised learning. So anytime you have inputs um, and then you have the, the targets that you use to train a model with, um, that that's that supervised learning. Right? We'll we'll talk a little bit later on in the course about unsupervised learning. 
right? So in that case, you only have input data. You don't have targets, but but there's certain things you can do with um, unsupervised learning transformations. So. Um, All right, so for linear regression, for the example that we have in here, um, in this case, um, so for, for the assignment, you've only got one input variable, the uh, population size. So in this example, though, we have an example of um, where we have multiple things that we're going to use as input for predictors. So basically, all these first uh, five columns um, we might use as input. As, as inputs to build a model for predicting the house price in this case, okay? So here the, the house price is, um, 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 oh, uh, th this is just the, the, the description of the thing. So the, um, uh, we've got what, 5,000, so that's five times 10 to the three, um, um, so, so 5,000, data in this um, uh, uh, data frame here. So um, we ought to be able to look at the raw data there if we wanted to. So we, in this case, we have to go up two levels uh, back to the data to find the um, this one for this notebook, right? So, um, so if you look down here, there should be 5,000 rows exactly, so 5,000 rows of data. So again, that that's the, the, the number of inputs is 5,000, where each input has uh, five features. Um, and then the sixth feature, oh, actually, it's, get, it's got more than that, but we, we throw away, we're not using the address. So we use the first five, um, and then the sixth one is going to be our label. So we'll, we'll pull that out for the um, for the, 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 the thing that we're trying to predict. Um, and this is, a, again, a real valued number, not like a category, zero, one, two, three we need to do a regression um, uh, to make a model to try and predict the house price given um, these other features, these other attributes. Um, so the average area income, housing age, um, um, and whatever these other features are. I'll, I'll skip through most of the stuff here. So, um, um, I mean, at the end, basically, what we show um, pulling out the stuff we need to be the inputs, and, and we call that kind of X by convention. So, we kind of drop uh, those. The, the, the one column is, is actually the labels, which is the house price, and then the other column we're not using um, in this example. Everything else we pull out to X. Um, and then we just pull out the price to become our labels that we can use for training. Right? Um, so, and then you know, so I get learn. I mean, then everything you know. Once you create a particular machine learning model that you want to use to try to train it. Um, and, and do predictions with or whatever you want to do with your train model. Um, once you create the model, so this is an example of, of object-oriented programming, right? So, so scikit-learn has, um, you create instances of, of whatever type of model that you want to train with. So linear regression, logistic regression, um, um, uh, 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 a free classifier, um, a, um, uh, Bayesian classifier, um, uh, whatever, right? So, so all those you can create an instance of an object, um, and then from that, that has the, the fit transform kinds of, of interface that we talked about, right? So, so we can fit a particular set of input data with our uh, labels. Um, basically, this is what I, I know, um, what people would call training the model. So, so fitting the inputs to our labels.
Um, well, I don't know why my notebooks do this here. I think this is a bug. So yeah, it, um, and again, it didn't show the outputs even though I reran the whole notebook here. So let's um, try rerunning that again, see if I can get these outputs here. So in particular, I mean, I asked you to, to show me this um, as well for your assignment too. So after we, um, after we fit this model, in this case, again, we had like five features. So we're gonna actually have five uh, coefficients, right? So the, these represent the values and, and we'll learn more about this next week. So, so but um, uh, these coefficients represented represent the fit for our linear regression here. Um, and then we have, have a sixth value, which is the, um, um, the intercept, right? So, so when we have five features, we actually have end up with six trained values, the five coefficients and this intercept value um, that we have here, right? So I, I think I talk about it in here. I mean, basically, you know, the way to think about these is that these give a linear relationship between each of the features and the thing that we're trying to predict, okay? So for example, um, um, I'm trying to think of what the easiest one is to, to give an example of. So. Um, well, so I'll just pick, so for example, the house age. So basically this is saying that for every year in change of the house age, since we're using a linear model, so for every year in change of house age, um, it changes um, the, the price by um, 165,637, right? Um, so, uh, it, 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 in general, kind of the, the relationship that's that's happening here. Um, you know, the same thing is kind of true for, for all of these, right? So, uh, Um, oh, somebody asked about which notebook are we working on? Um, so um, yeah, this is the 3-4. The this is the one I was trying to find. So um, um, again, if you don't see that one, um, so, so this is mentioned, and this is an important one for the assignment here, but um, it wasn't in the um, HOML. It was over here in the archive um, just because this wasn't really material directly from the um, hands-on machine learning, um, but I should probably put that in, in a different name. So, but yeah, there's some additional ones um, over here, um, including this one uh, on the scikit-learn and the stats model stuff here. So. Okay, um, Okay, anyway, yeah, so there's other additional stuff in here. So um, I actually talked a little bit about um, splitting into train and test um, and show an example of that. So, um, um, and then in this case, training a model just with part of the data. So the data in the training set um, and then um, evaluating it. Um, um, on the original training data, but also on the uh, the data um, that was held back that we didn't train with, so evaluated on the test data. So.
So anyway, I mean, this is kind of what you want to see. So if your model isn't uh, overfitting, you should expect to get basically um, not much of a, um, a loss in performance when you evaluate it on your test data. So in fact, it actually does, um, the, it reduces the error a little bit, which, you know, can happen. So, um, 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 so our error was a little bit. So, so again, though, it's even this doesn't necessarily mean that this is a good model. Um, it, it just means that um, um, it's not overfitting. So in this case, uh, since the performance didn't decrease, um, 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 it didn't overfit on the training data. So it's doing about the same on the, the, the test data as it did on the training data here. But it's still kind of a question. So, I mean, can we do better? Can we get a model that would generalize, but also would, would have less error overall, right? And, and would still work well on data that it hasn't seen before. Um, Okay, so, um, that, and then there's also example of, of doing um, logistic regression. Again, um, the name isn't really great here. So really logistic regression is a type of classification task instead of a regression task. Um, so um, we can use a logistic regression to build a classifier um, on our data set here. Um, so here, uh, in the second example, we're using uh, this well-known data set, the MNIST, which is basically a data set of um, image data. And in this case, um, we would want to build a classifier. This, this is not a binary classifier, so this is a, an example of a multi-class classification. So here, we would want to predict whether the, the number is a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9 digit in this uh, digit. Uh, um, so. um, but, you know, so again, we could, we could split into train and test data. Uh, but um, after that, um, you know, fitting the model is, is, is again, it's going to be the, the same kind of pattern if we're using scikit-learn. So um, we just do a fit with the train with, with the inputs and the labels um, to, to, to fit our logistic regression model in this case. Oh, right? well, this is an example of what I was talking about of, of some meta parameters. Okay, so instead of using the defaults, when we instantiate um, our logistic regression model that we want to train here, um, we specify some slightly different values than the defaults. So we want to use a different um, solver. Um, so this is this is the thing that um, um, does our what's known as gradient descent here, or, or the optimization method, basic basically here, um, and. Uh, uh, this is a multi-class problem, so we're explicitly telling it to, to do a multi-class classification here. So, in any case, um, so yeah, the logistic regression in this example actually does pretty well. Um, so I think I'm only using like. Um, a pretty small data set in this example. Um, and, and yeah, like only the first five digits or something like that. I can't remember exactly, but um, um, but yeah, it doesn't do too bad. So, you know, um, um, we get 100% or, or 1.0 accuracy if we uh, score the model. So do the predictions on the data that we train with, but the, the accuracy is still pretty good. Uh, it's fine if we, if we do it on the, the test data. Here. So. Oh, um, so I did ask for like a confusion matrix at one point. So whenever you're doing a classification, 
Um, you can create this kind of a thing called a confusion matrix. Uh, again, we'll talk more about these later on. Uh, in fact, this week, uh, the, in this week's materials, um, 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 uh, we go into into uh, like a confusion matrix and um, uh, recall and precision. So that's some of the stuff that we talk about for the binary classifier here. So. So yeah, once again, um, so somebody asked again, so this is like the third or the fourth time I've, I've talked about this and sorry, it's not in kind of the normal place, but but this lecture notebook that we're, that I'm going through right here is the um, the one named 3-4 um, and it's it's actually over in the um, um, archive. Um, so the 3-4 the using SK Learn and STATS model. So that's the one I'm looking at. Um, uh, here right now that I've been talking about. So, all right. Um, all right. So, anyway, a uh, confusion matrix um, only makes sense for. Um, uh, uh, categorical data, so for a classifier. So you can ask, right, so um, if you run it through, if you train a model, a classification model like, like we did here, and then you ask it to, to give me predictions for a set of data, you can ask how it did. So um, if I predicted a zero, it was actually a zero, um, it would show up in the confusion matrix right here. So this is the count of, uh, so everything on the diagonal is the things that were predicted correctly, right? And then everything on the off, you know, the, that's not on the diagonal were mispredictions, right? So here we predicted that it was an eight um, where it was actually a nine, only one time, right? Um, so you can see that it's doing pretty well. Um, so I guess actually it wasn't just using the first five, it was using all nine uh, digits here, um, but um, anyway. Um. So, okay. Um. I was trying to think that um, in, in terms of the assignment that you're supposed to be doing for Friday here, um, again, yeah, there's examples of doing, I think most of the stuff with scikit-learn, although there's not examples of the decision boundary here. So I guess I didn't have that. Um, um, in our example here, so, so again, you know, it, um, it would be kind of complex to do for this model because we've got coefficients and intercepts for all um, uh, so it's even more complex for this example here but but the, the basic idea is that, that we're going to have coefficients and an intercept term for each one of our uh, inputs and in, in this case the inputs um, um, uh, is, is we've got quite a large number of them because every pixel is an input um, in this particular example. So, so there's a, a quite a larger number of them in this case here. So I think it was eight by eight. Um, so anyway. Um, Okay, yeah, so let's, let, let me also talk a little bit about the stats model here then. Um, so this was just more, uh, we, we won't be using the, the stats model library um, as very much. Um, we'll, we'll mostly be using scikit-learn. Uh, but, you know, I, I thought it would, it would be a good idea to at least um, introduce you to this, just, just to, to kind of see the differences, right? So, um, um, Stats model uh, um, is a different library. It has a slightly different focus, but you can do a lot of the same similar things, right? So you can do statistical analysis and create models uh, using uh, the Stats models library. 
Um, so we can do the same linear regression and logistic regression uh, using that model uh, here on the same data. So for example, um, um, we can do it on our house price data. Um, so, Um, I guess, yeah, I mean, again, th this, will, this will make a lot more sense um, um, in another week or two once we get into the details of how linear regression works and, and what it means to be adding in this um, um, our intercept feature, this, this dummy um, column that we need here. Um, but since it's so common, you can actually just add it by, um, you can call a method from the stats model library to, that you need in order to add in this constant error. This is really just adding in a, um, um, a row of ones here. So um, uh, we could have shown what it did here. So for example, um, Let me restart and let's um, run everything up to this point here. So, um, so if you just drop those two columns from there, the, the result is um, um, that we've now got, you know, we've got 5,000 um, um, uh, rows, so 5,000 items in our training data here, and we've got five features. So that's the number of columns, right? Uh, after we drop one that's our label and the other one that we're not using for our predictor here, right? And then those those five features are the ones that we already looked at. So it's like the the age of the house and um, the number of rooms, um, the number of bedrooms, and and some other uh, features like that, right? So um, and, and we'll look at like for example the first five of those. So this should be the first five rows, all columns of the first five rows. Um, of, of this uh, data set here. So X, oh, X is a, um, um, a, a pandas uh, data frame since I read it in using pandas here. So, um, so I can't, I was, trying, I was trying to treat it like a um, NumPy array. So, um, um, So we talked about this in the notebook about you know pandas. So um, like uh, we could use if I use iloc, I can do what I was trying to do, kind of treat it as if, it, if using integer indexes. So um, I think so get the first five rows and then all the columns. Yeah, that's what I try to do. So. Um, so that's the stuff we have in here. So anyway, when you fit um, a linear model here, you actually have to add in a term for the, what's known as the bias term here. Um, so all this add constant is doing is adding in an additional row and, and that row has all ones for the data. And then we'll see why next week, why we, we have to do something like that, like this here. So when you use scikit-learn, it, it, it kind of does this for you automatically. So you, so you don't have to do this by hand. But, but again, when you do stats model, uh, people more working with the stats model library it, it, um, expect that um, um, this isn't added normally um, unless uh, you, they need to do it. And then in which case they expect you need to do it by hand and add it in here. So um, after we add the constant, We'll see that, uh, oh yeah, and, and, and in this case, 
Um, it actually kind of knows pandas data frames as well, so it actually adds it with a name for the column called C-O-N-S-T for the constant. But it's, it's really just adding um, another row, or sorry, another column with the values of one for all of, all of the items um, uh, in there, right? So uh, we could have actually done that by hand if we wanted to. So, um, but um, um, you can also use the add constant from stats model to do that. So, um, oh yeah, some other differences. So, um, so stats model, um, if you want to fit some data to labels to do a linear regression, um, you call this OLS, which stands for ordinary least squares, which is another name for doing a linear regression. So um, um, uh, linear regression uses, um, um, we normally use this uh, function called the, uh, the, the least squared um, uh, fitness function here. Again, this is a lot, of, a lot of stuff we're going to be talking about this in more detail here, starting next week. So, um, but also it kind of does it backwards um, from um, scikit-learn library. So you have to pass in the labels first, um, and then the um, input data second here. Um, and you need to add in that column explicitly. Um, um, if you want to do the same kind of fit as what we were doing with scikit-learn, right? So you need to add in that that column of, of ones um, as a as the bias constant here. So. Um, oh, and and yeah, there are other differences, you know. So so again, this is this is a completely different library, the stats model. So um, um, by doing this, we're actually instantiating. Um, a model and we're telling it what's going to be the data that we use but um, um, so instead of, of passing the data to do the fit when we call it fit function we pass in the data when we instantiate our model and then we just call fit and it will actually fit the parameters like we did before here um, uh, but yeah if you compare these back to what we had for um, Put our fitted parameters when we did um, scikit-learn. They should be the same um, in this case here. Go back up here a bit. Um, so these are the, the, the coefficients to compare here. So for example, 21.5780 for the average uh, area income. So this is in scientific notation, but it's, it's basically the same, 21.5780 here. And I think these all should be the same um, because in this case, um, well, anyway, so, so you should get pretty similar, if not exactly the same uh, coefficients uh, for both of these fits here. If you, if you go, if you take the time to go back and compare them back and forth here. So. Um, all right, so uh, uh, people are using stats models or are doing linear regressions, statisticians that do this, and th this is kind of an important thing for them. So, so they, they usually want to know the summary information from stats model. Um, so this gives the same coefficients that we just showed here uh, for the, um, um, for our five parameters and for the, um, um, the, the bias term. Um, 
but it also gives extra information. So, so this is all meaningful to people that are used to, to uh, working with uh, linear regressions like this. Um, so in particular, this column is pretty uh, is something that um, um, statisticians really want to know about. So this, this is the measure of the p-value, uh, 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 measure of each of these coefficients, right? Where smaller is better here. Um, so yeah, for this linear regression, I mean, all the parameters except for the number of bedrooms, um, Um, have relatively small p-values, right? Which means that they're probably pretty useful in this prediction. But but this one, so so often a p-value of 0 0.05 is used as a cutoff. Um, um, so in this case, um, uh, this is indicating that, the, that this parameter might not be um, very useful um, in, in building our linear regression model for this set of data here. So it's, a, it's not a very good predictor, um, unlike these others. It looks like they might be useful here. So. Um, Okay, uh, what else can I say about that? But uh, but yeah, when you're doing the, the second assignment, you might want to also give the summary. When you give out the summary of your stats model, um, model that you fit, you should find that the coefficients are the same as you know pulling them out by hand um, by, by pulling out these params here. So if you compare those. You know. um, All right, and then finally, you can also, of course, do a logistic regression, um, which is really a classification using STAS model as well. Um, so, I mean, you know, again, you do need to um, add in that constant in order to get the same result as doing a logistic regression from scikit-learn. If you don't do that, you'll get different results so, so but but that's basically adding in the same idea of, of a dummy column of all ones for this bias term for our model here um, but after that you know that the, the uh, it works pretty much the same as the logistic regression um, although the the, the name um, of the model is this um, MN legit which is a multinomial logistic regression um, Um, oh yeah, so you will get a warning about non-convergence here, um, which is actually uh, kind of an issue. Um, but uh, so yeah, that, that means that when the model doesn't converge, um, um, it's not really, hasn't really um, uh, done a good fit here. So you can't get a summary like we did before. So, um, But with a little bit of work, you can use the, the model, even though it didn't uh, converge yet in the, um, in the basic thing that we did here um, to make predictions with it. And you'll get, should get a similar accuracy to what we had with the scikit-learn. So it was like 97% um, on the uh, testing data. So. Um,
Okay, so yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you need to work through this one um, before you look through the assignment two. Um, it should answer most of the questions, I hope, um, um, when you um, um, compare this to, to what I asked you to do on assignment two. Uh, anybody anybody want to ask um, anything about uh, this? Uh, Using scikit learn and the stats model here that we kind of ran through. Um, let's see what else? Yeah, it's already 6.30 here. Um, let me just bring up real quickly then the, um, um, the two other notebooks um, that I ask you to, so there'll be a lot more details about um, binary classification um, and some other things like um, precision recall and the um, confusion matrix and things like that. Um, in the 3-1 and 3-2 uh, notebooks here. Um, so yeah, we, we again use the MNIST data um, in these examples. Um, I don't think it should take too long to do these, although know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. So, um, I'll move on here while I'm waiting for this to, um, to uh, run some of these cells here. So, um, So, oh, so yeah, we show some some different examples of some classifiers. So instead of using a logistic regression, which again is, is actually a classifier to use a logistic regression, we, sh we show. Uh, so, so most of the classifiers in scikit-learn, except for logistic regression, but otherwise, and they often will use the name classifier if they're mainly used as you know, for, uh, to build uh, classification models. Right, so like SGD classifiers. The SGD, we'll talk more about st st the stochastic uh, gradient descent. Um, this is really just a very general method for um, uh, for uh, for optimizing uh, a fitness function. So, um, but uh, but yeah, you can kind of use this generically to build a classifier. So that's kind of what the SGD classifier does. Um, so I, I think in my case, I think it's just, um, I guess I haven't fetched the M and IST data before on this, um, in my dev box here. So I think it's actually because I've got a slow connection here. It's taking a while to, to fetch this data down. That's probably what it's doing there. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, we, so we already talked about kind of the basic, you know, so again, once you get the data in the right form, um, um, you know, into your uh, X matrix um, uh, for training and then your labels, um, you can fit your model um, and then you can, um, once you have a model fit, then you can use other methods for, in predictions or scoring how well it does and, and so on. So there's examples of those things in here. Um, so 
so yeah, I mean, uh, evaluating um, how you evaluate how well a model is doing um, is a little bit different for a classifier than for um, a, a regression problem, right? So for a regression problem, um, basically how well you do is just the, the difference between the number you predict um, and the, 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 the actual number. So for when we're trying to predict house prices, how far away you were is a measure of, um, of, of, of your accuracy for a regression model. So, so yeah, I've, I've switched over then to the, the 3-1, 3-2, um, which was kind of the focus of this week where we get into talking about classification. Um, so building classifiers, basically. So we focus in, on those a little bit this week here. Um, So, so for a regression problem, uh, measuring your performance um, is, is kind of a, a simple sort of thing, right? It's just the difference between your predicted value and the actual value, right? And 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 um, really how far away you are. So you don't really care if you under predict it. So if, if if your predicted price was too small or too big. Um, um, it, it doesn't really matter. It's just how far away you were from the predicted price, right? But for a classification, um, um, I mean, it's a little bit trickier. So especially if we talk about a multi-class problem, right? So so really, um, like like for, for this one where we have ten digits, zero through nine. Uh, just because you predict a zero and the actual digit was a nine, I mean, that's no worse than predicting a zero and the actual digit was a one, right? So, so, so how the sort of the magnitude of the difference doesn't really tell you anything for a classification problem. It's just whether you got it correct or not, really, right? Um, So anyway, I mean, you know, we, we talk a little bit more about um, um, how you measure, how you evaluate, how well your fitted model does for, you know, when you're trying to um, do a, a, a classification problem here. So, you know, again, you should be using some sort of, of uh, split between your train and your test data. Uh, and, and that's what cross validation does. Um, so we talk a little bit about that. Our textbook talks about that more if you, if you read the textbook description of these things. So. Um, But, but, you know, once you've trained a classifier, whatever your classifier is, like the SGD classifier here, or, you know, um, uh, those other classifiers that we're gonna talk about more in this class. Um, so once you've trained it, um, um, there's lots of things you can ask about how well it's doing in order to evaluate how well it's doing. So one is the confusion matrix that we already talked a little bit about here. So there's different ways of, of calculating the confusion matrix for a classifier. Um, um, like, for example, using the uh, confusion matrix function from, from scikit-learn, um, we'll, we'll calculate it for you. Um, But that's, I don't know, I find confusion matrices, um, they, they give you kind of the raw view of how well a classifier is doing, but, but they're, use, they're usually useful always to, to print out your confusion matrix of, of your predictions on your uh, test data, right? So, um, but there's other measures of so precision and recall. Um, we talk a little bit about here. 
Um, so the, the, you know, the, the, the problem with a confusion matrix is it, it is kind of like the raw data. It's just, um, um, you know, I predicted this um, and this is what the actual label was and, and, and just um, um, summing up how you did for, for all of the possible predictions versus actual labels, right? So sometimes you need a summary though, um, you know, a single number. Um, and that's kind of what, um, well, what um, the, um, the ROC uh, can kind of give you. So, um, but yeah, before that, so you can, you can calculate things like precision and recall. Um, and I'll let you read about these. Um, but, but these are giving you numbers between, um, which are basically ratios between your true positive rates um, to other things. So precision is the true positive rate ratio to the true positive plus the false positives, um, which can be useful for understanding um, certain kinds of classification performance. Uh, and then recall is the, the ratio between the true positives and the true positive plus the false negatives. And the textbook discusses why these precision and recall, why these ratios are, are useful a bit. Um, and then um, another kind of thing that's often used for classification problems are these uh, receiver operating characteristics or the ROC. Um, so um, it has Excuse a similar, me, has a similar, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sir, are you referring to the, uh, the 031 and 032, the, yeah, zero, 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 the, files in the, the files in the HOML folder? Yeah, 031, 032, and HOML. Okay, yeah. thank you, sir. So, so these are the notebooks for this week, basically, that you should be going over. So along, along with the, um, the other one that's in the archives notebook, the SAS model and uh, scikit-learn. Um, So I, yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to go into the details uh, of these. Um, so you should read about these. Um, so so all of these are basically precision recall or ROC um, are useful. Um, tools to use. They're useful tools to use for um, uh, if you need to measure your performance for uh, a classification. Yeah, so, so if you're building models for doing classification. So. Um, yeah, and there's various ways that you can plot all these. So, so there's examples of doing those for precision recall and for ROC. And, pl and plotting the, the so-called um, ROC curve. Um, so. um, and then, yes, I, I think I'm just going to wrap up here. So um, in the second notebook, um, so, you know, our, our, the, the basic thing that you do for classification is, is binary classification. That, and that's all that we talk about in 3-1, uh, which is like the first half of chapter three from our um, hands-on machine learning textbook. So, um, so I already mentioned, so the, the, the first thing, so not all classification problems or binary classification problems. So, so I mean, it, it, is, it is often the case that um, um, you will have a multi-class classification problem and that, that's pretty normal. And, and so we already saw examples of that, like the MNISD. So if I'm gonna build a classifier to classify each of the 10 digits, um, that's, an, that's an example of multi-class classification. Um, and in general, you know, scikit-learn, um, there are some models in scikit-learn that um, 
only work well for a binary classification. So if you want to do multi-class classification for those, um, you might have to do some specific things. But but for the most part, Scikit-Learn kind of hides the details of that. So so um, our textbook discusses this a little bit. Um, um, so if you're using a model that really only works with binary classification, you have to do some special things if you really want to do multi-class classification. So, I mean, at, at the, 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 the most fundamental, the most brute, brute force kind of thing you have to do is um, you might have to, to train multiple classifiers, right? So if I have a, multi, a true multi-class classification problem, but I want to do a model that, that only really can do binary classification. So one thing I can do is just build a classifier for um, like, like, like for the MNIST data, I can build a classifier to classify zero or not zero. So build a classifier for that and then build a classifier for one or not ones, right? So if you, if you do all those, then um, I can combine all those to, for the general case uh, to, to classify any digit. That's kind of one approach if I only have a model that can really only work for binary classification. Um, uh, and then sort of more complicated is that I can just build classifiers for pairs. So, ver so like zeros versus ones or zeros versus twos, zero versus threes and so on, right? So that's another approach if I only have um, a model that, that really works with binary um, classes, right? So, um, but um, I mean, you know, you ought to you ought to know that that's happening. Um, but um, but Scikit Learn um, will hide some of those details from you, right? So if you have to do that by hand, it can get really messy, right? So so if I had to, if I if I needed to, for some reason, use um, a, a classifier that really was only inherently binary, like SGD is really only inherently binary. So if you wanted to do that by hand, you would have to do kind of the thing that's being described here. Um, um, but for the most part, um, scikit-learn will do all that grunt work for you. So, so train all the multiple classifiers that you need to in order to support multi-class classification, even though you've really only got a classifier that works on binary classes. Um, so. um, And then, yeah, the final thing I'll mention then is um, um, so when our textbook talks about multi-class, so, so, so you know, the, the distinction is between either a binary classification or a, a classification task that has more than two values. So it calls that multi-class, all right? Um, and then from our, from our hands-on machine learning uh, textbook. Um, you can also have a problem where you have you want to predict multiple outputs. Um, or well, um, um, so I don't want to confuse the uh, the terminology that our textbook uses here, but um, so the, the the thing that our textbook calls multi-label classification. That's really just um, um, where um, instead of having a single value that we're trying to predict, we've got two values. So, so for the same input, 
uh, we've, we've got two labels, right? So, you know, for, for multi-label classification, uh, you, you could just build two separate classifiers, right? So that that's typical. So I, I just create one classifier to um, uh, determine whether something is uh, a large digit, seven, eight, or nine, and then I could build a separate classifier to determine if the digit is odd, one, three, five, seven, or nine. Right. So that was all that was being done in this simple example here. Right. But scikit-learn, you can actually do those at the same time. Um, so, I, so I can actually train a model um, where the Y actually has two labels instead of one. Um, and for some models, um, it will correctly uh, build a classifier that can give two outputs whenever you give uh, an input. That's what we asked, asked for here. So, so it calls that multi-label, right? Uh, and then the most general case, but, but here we were just doing a multi-label, but where the output was still binary. So either it was uh, a, a big number, 789 or not. So, so the, the thing we're trying to predict was either 0 or 1, or here, whether it was odd or not. But again, we, we were trying to do a binary prediction. You know, it was odd, one, or it was not odd, zero, right? So then the most general case is that you could have multi-label, but then um, the, the labels are, uh, instead of being binary, they are um, multi-class. Um, so so non-binary outputs. Um, Right. So, I've, and you know, I don't know how often these things. I'm just kind of mentioning these in passing. So, like for example, for for the the multi-label case, um, um, unless there was a particular reason to want to do this all at the same time, I would usually split that up into separate classifiers. Right. So one classifier for the big digits, uh, one binary classifier for to determine whether it's big or not versus another classifier to determine whether it's odd or even. Um, all right. So let me, um, I think I'm gonna wrap up there. Um, does anybody kind of have anything you wanna ask here before I am? Um, Kind of close out the session it's about the assignment or uh, anything else. I don't know if this one ever finished there, but it's, it's just taking a long time to load. <laughs> um, all right, so. Um, yeah, like I said, I, I'm going to go ahead and finish our session for the day here, you know, so you definitely should work through these notebooks. Um, of course, the, like I said, the, probably the most important one is to the, the, um, the using the scikit-learn and the stats model um, um, will be the one that will be help, most helpful as you're thinking about assignment two here. But, you know, don't skip over the, um, uh, the ones on the binary class classifiers, so you'll need that as well. Um, although next week, then, we're going to come back to look, talking about linear regression in, in detail, um, or regression in general. So we'll kind of come back to talking about regression problems. Um, but but um, um, after we get into detail about regression next week or two, we'll come back to classification then, um, um, talking about classification problems. Um, all right, so, um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead in the session there and I'll, I'll post this, um, 
as usual here. Um, but uh, if you have questions about the assignment, go ahead and email them to me um, as usual. Um, and I'll see you guys later then.